Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. Yes, it does, John. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yes, sir. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you, Lord. That brother John, I am telling you. Well, I got gadgets to work here. Let's see. <clears throat> well, I'm hoping I got these mics hooked up right. Fire starts flying out of them. Y'all say, that's a Holy Ghost to work. That'll be fine. That'll be fine. What's that, Marie? Yeah, there you go. There you go. <clears throat> Bishop, uh, Bishop Carpenter, the late Bishop Carpenter, he told a tale one time. He said uh, he was wanting people to <clears throat> get excited about, about giving missions. And said he asked his, uh, his mission director, he said, what can we possibly do to get people excited about giving the missions? You know, when we talk about it. He said, well, he said, let's talk to old Jack. He said, Jack's an electrician. He said, we'll talk to Jack, see if we can't wire these pews up. <laughs> and when, when you say, how many in here want to give to missions? He said, we'll have old Jack punch a button. <laughs> and he said, they'll come off in seats when he punches it. And he said, that way everybody in the church will think everybody's giving to missions. And he said, that sounds like a plan. Let's do that. So he said, they did that. They had old Jack wire them pews up. And said, when he got up there, and he said, how many wants to give to missions? He said Jack punched that button. He said he ended up electrocuting four deacons. They wouldn't jump. <laughs> they wouldn't get up. So they kept sitting there. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you tell one. Hey, Amen. Uh, 
baby and used to they had the water bucket sitting out on the bench outside on the porch, you know, and a dish pan, a wash pan where you wash your hands. And uh, that morning it had ice on top of it, okay? This woman had a baby and they didn't have no name for it. So they decided they was going to name it Icy May. Because <laughs> it had ice on the that's a real story in it. <laughs> Miss Icy May from Hanging Dog. Yeah, <laughs> I can see that happening down there in Indian country. I can see that. Yeah, that's a beautiful, beautiful area. Well, <clears throat> I gave you the notes for, for week number 76. You don't have to fill out anything on those. That's the ones that I used uh, when I went through it online. But tonight, uh, I gave you the notes, the ones that have the blanks are for this week. And we're still in chapter 18, and we're still talking about the, uh, the final fall of Babylon. So, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, verses 4 through 8, and then we will go back and we'll, we'll talk about them. <clears throat> Verse 4, chapter 18. John writes, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself, and lived luxuriously, in the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen, and am no widow, and shall not see sorrow. So therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And we're, we're talking about, he's personifying a system here. He, he's personifying the capital city of the world at that time, but because it is the capital city of the world, that's where all the business is run out of. <clears throat> so even though it, it's talking about a her, it's not an actual, not an actual person, but it's actually the whole system uh, of commerce. Father, we thank you tonight for these who are here and those who've tuned us in. And as Brother John saying, it's getting gooder and gooder. And we thank you so much for that. We realize that, that those who are not able to be here will soon be able to be here. We know that, that this thing is, you're, you're taking care of it for us and you're going to heal our people and, and bring us back. So tonight, Lord, as we look into this word, <clears throat> I pray that as you gave these words for John to put down on the parchment, that Holy Spirit, you're the same, that you open them up to us here tonight. Help us to understand them, to see that which we need to see as a church and as individuals, so that, so that we will be better disciples and we'll be better evangelists. And we'll give you all the thanks and praise and glory for every bit of it. In the wonderful name of Jesus, and all the saints would say, we love you, Lord. Amen and amen. Well, on your notes there, <clears throat> I was going to go back and give some review, but I looked and I thought, well, this is, this is a good review. This is a good short review here. The, the paragraph there at the top. This, this vision that <clears throat> John is showing us, uh, it's being explained to John, showing him how the religious system and the government both will rise and fall under the Antichrist. Now, we know the old Roman Empire will be revived, and the world capital, that's what we're talking about, Babylon, the world capital for religion and commerce will be established in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. And then <clears throat> the religious system will fall, being destroyed by the ten kings that we read about, chapter 17. And that will leave the commercial Babylon, or the, the commerce, 
that we're talking about here in chapter 18 and on into chapter 19. Now the commerce and the economic collapse, listen, is the final happening that precedes Christ's coming to establish His kingdom, which will take us into the millennium, which will take the people into the millennial period. So remember the last time we were in here, I put the board up here and I tried to draw all that, all that design about how all that works together. In the first three and a half years, the religious system will be established, which will be the old system of sacrifice. The Jews will, will bring that back. It's interesting what's going on right now in Israel, isn't it? With, with all the problems they're having, and especially there at the Temple Mount, where that big mosque is. And the Temple Mount is, is where this temple will be reconstructed during the tribulation. It will be there where they're having all this trouble right now. So, that, so that's interesting. But anyway, the first three and a half years, the religious system would be reinstituted and the economy will be reinstituted, but they will be in cahoots. It, it, will, both, it will both run together. We talked about that. Well, once the religious system falls apart, which it does, and those ten kings will make sure they wipe it out. We studied that, chapter 17. And once the religious system is gone, and everybody is forced to worship the Antichrist or be killed, the commerce, the business part, the economy will continue. It will, it will continue to flourish and actually get more prosperous once the religious system is gone up until the final, either the final months or the final weeks prior to Christ coming back to earth to set up the millennial kingdom. And, and once, once it begins to fall apart, once the economy, all the business and all that begins to go down the drain, that's the last thing to go before Christ steps in. But before He comes back at the end of the tribulation. I, I, just, I just find it interesting that it started, the tribulation began <clears throat> in, in peace with the religious system being instituted and now it's going to end with everything going down the drain in the commerce part of it. Because, because the religion and the commerce was so intertwined that, that, that it was all working together. So that's what we're studying. That's where we're headed in these final chapters of Revelation. Well, let's look at verse 4. <clears throat> John said, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, come out of this, this system, my people, lest you will share in her sins and you will receive of her plagues. Now, this voice that says, come out of her, my people, who is that? Sure, Jesus. That's exactly right. That's the voice of Christ. Because we are His people and, and He will have people on the earth even during that time. People will still be on earth that will trust Christ even into the final part of that tribulation. And where will they come from? Well, you remember those 144,000 witnesses? They're still around. They hadn't went anywhere. <laughs> he sent them to the earth. Now, those witnesses are going to gain converts. They're, they will be going throughout the world while all this is going on. Those 144,000 evangelists will still be here and they're His people. And then those that they, that they get to trust in Him. Now we know that under that regime, those who don't worship the Antichrist are going to be killed. But we know that God does what for these 144,000? He has a mark on them that they're not going to be killed by the Antichrist. So they're converts and, and those <clears throat> will still be left on the earth during all this. So Christ sends out, sends out a, if you want to say a warning or a message to them. And He said, come out of that, that system. Don't, don't trust in that system because if you do, then you're going to be caught up with her. You're, you're going to be... See, I think that's a hard thing for us as Christians to really, to really grasp is we live in this world, but we really can't be a part of this world. And, and that's hard for us to try to separate because we have to live like everybody else has to live, but that doesn't mean we have to get caught up 
into the worldly system. That, that's what the church does by coming out of the worldly system. So that, that's what he's talking about. Now, I know that, I know this because of the scriptures that, that refer to it. First of all, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And, and I hope I got them listed right. We find out when I get there. Deuteronomy chapter 4. That's your scripture reference, one of them. And let's look at verses 30 and 31 in Deuteronomy chapter 4. <clears throat> Here, here's what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 4 where, where Moses is given the commands to them. In, in verse 30 in that chapter, When you are in distress, and all these things come upon you, when? In the latter days. Final days. When you turn to the Lord your God and obey His voice, <clears throat> for the Lord your God is a merciful God, when you do that, He will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which He swore to them. In the latter days. That's what we're studying in Revelation, is the latter days. And Moses commanded those people when, when those days, when, you know, when they get to that part, when the Jews get into that, as I've said, it's, it's pointed at the Jews. He said, all of them come upon you. When you turn to the Lord your God and obey His voice, then He's going to hear you. So there will be those in the latter days who will turn to Him. Now the other Scripture reference on that is Jeremiah chapter 51. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 51. <clears throat> and we're, we're going to establish it in this chapter as well. Jeremiah chapter 51. I'm ahead in there. Alrighty. Jeremiah chapter 51. Let's look at verses 5 through 7 here in this chapter. And this chapter is talking about the destruction of Babylon. Alright? In verse 5, For Israel is not forsaken, nor Judah, by his God, the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Watch this. Flee from the midst of Babylon, and every one save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. See? And He shall recompense her. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, and therefore the nations are deranged. Verse 8, Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed, wail for her, take balm for her pain, and perhaps she may be healed. So both of these prophets are pointing to what we're reading about right here in chapter 18 of Revelation. That as I have said all along, God has not given up on His people. It, it, is, not, it is not the teaching that the church has replaced Israel because it has not. It has not. He is still going to take care of His people. He prophesied it through Jeremiah. He prophesied it in Deuteronomy. That's just two places. And He's going to do that. So that's the voice of Christ saying, come out of her so that you won't be held responsible for her sins as she is. Now look at verse 5. <clears throat> Huh? What what is it there will be? There will be the hundred and forty four thousand. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. There will be the hundred and forty four thousand witnesses and their converts. Mm -hmm. Their converts. That that that's how they will come to know the Lord in those final days of the tribulation is through these witnesses that God, these evangelists as we call them that He has sent to the earth. Alright. 
<clears throat> in verse 5, for her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. I found it interesting that that word reached <clears throat> and just reading through that and like I always tell you, you know, you don't have to be a, a scholar in Greek or, you know, to understand the Bible. I mean, the English Bible is good. It tells us what everything is. But I just find it interesting how some of the words work. When I read this word reached, in the Greek context, it says, for her sins have been piled on. That, that was how the terminology read. It's the same word. You, you know, the word used for reach was the same word. But I thought it interesting that one of the definitions was her sins have been piled on. And her sins has reached to heaven. So, so really he, he's saying, you, you know, that's it. You, you've put enough sin out here. You've had enough sin that now it's going to break the wagon down. You know, it's been piled on. And, and it means that her sins have accumulated. That's what goes in your blank. Her sins have been accumulating. Since, since the beginning, all this sin that's in the world today, all this that's going on, all this rebellion against God, listen, all that's adding up. It's adding up. It's just getting piled on, piled on. But, but there's coming a day, there's coming a day, but that's the end of it. <laughs> it's so much. I, I used to tell people in, in counseling that, that you know, life is like going through life pulling a wagon, and when when the stresses and things come upon us, it's like putting a brick on that wagon, and the more bricks you get on your wagon, the harder it becomes to pull. And if you don't do something about alleviating some of those bricks, then sooner or later it's going to break the wheels off your wagon, and you're going to be dragging that thing through life with all that stuff on it. So so this is pretty much what God's saying. Her sin is piled on to the extent that it's going to be dealt with. Even though they got by with it, even though the world gets by with sin, doesn't, doesn't, that, kind of, doesn't that kind of puzzle you sometimes? Why God allows sin to go on? Does that ever puzzle you? It's happening today, Charles. Does it ever make you wonder, why does He allow these things to happen? Why does He allow this you know, to go on? Well, you, you, can, you can rest assured in the fact it's not getting by him. It's not getting by him. He, he's not turning his head to it. He sees all of it because it's accumulated. And when, when he says here in this verse that God has remembered her iniquities, <laughs> that don't mean that they've been out of sight. And all of a sudden he said, oh, I knew what happened back in, in the beginning in the garden. No, that means... He has not forgotten her rebellion. He's not forgotten the rebellion of humanity against Him. And humans are still rebelling against Him, but He's not going to forget that. He doesn't just say, well, just let it go. <laughs> no, He's a merciful God, and He's a just God. Moses pointed that out when we read there in Deuteronomy, but He is also a God of vengeance. He is also a God who is justified in bringing punishment upon sin. Yes, sir. Every every idle word, every word that, that's that's wasted towards him in regards to rebellion. Yeah, they'll they'll have to they'll have to stand up for all that. So that's what that's what he says. Her sins have reached to heaven. In other words, <laughs> they they've been piled high enough. Interesting language too, because if you remember, Babylon come from where? The Tower of Babel. And remember what they were doing with the Tower of Babel? They were building the tower to where? To heaven. And now her sins have reached heaven. So it's interesting language, but that's how it ended up. Now look at verse 6. Now render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. God is simply saying, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Remember we just read that in Jeremiah. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. She's going to fall. The system is going to fall. 
it's it's more than just the old the Levitical law. It's more or Deuteronomy. It's more than an eye for an eye. Remember, that was part of the law. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This goes above and beyond that. It's got past that point. Double, a double portion of punishment. Now, the language indicates when, when it talks about mixing, that, that's, that's figures of speech. So the language indicates that what she mixed for pleasure, that goes in your blank, what this system had mixed for pleasure, God is now using that and mixing it for destruction. That that it's we'll see as we go into it, as especially we get into next week into some of the verses. We're going to see how that's going to how that's going to take place. So he says, render to her just like she rendered to you, which is the vengeance. And her, her payment, repay her double according to her works, according to the rebellion. So it will go above and beyond that punishment that, <clears throat> that she has, has brought upon the people through her deceptions and, and everything she, she will be doing or the system will be doing to those people in the world. Verse 7, In the measure... <clears throat> Jesus said, that which is measured unto you will will be expected. In the measure that she glorified herself, the system glorified itself, and it lived luxuriously. It was very prosperous. Now in that same measure, as much as they prospered, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, here's how it's coming about, the system boasts, I sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Prosperity will do that to them. Prosperity did that to Israel. Every time Israel began to prosper, under God, what did they do? The more prosperous they got, Marie, the more they rebelled, the more they forgot about God. And, and, and you know, you're thinking, well, God, why don't you just take the prosperity and maybe they'll come back to you? <gasps> do we really want Him to do that? <laughs> well, if that's what's going to bring people to God. I mean, because His bottom line is none should perish but that all should have everlasting life. So the fact that, that it will be prosperous, see that the religious system will collapse, the commerce system, the business system will pick up, the government will be running the show, they'll be running all the business, the people will begin to prosper, the whole system will begin to prosper, and everything is going to look like we got this thing. That's why, that's why this language is used when she said, I sit as queen. That just simply means I'm controlling this thing. <laughs> you know, this system's controlling it. Amen, Charles. Perfectly said. That's what that's what your notes is. Uh, on on your notes, it means that her prosperity will blind them to God's judgments. Their prosperity will blind them to the judgments of God. They will get caught up in the system and they will forget that they're being judged by God. That's what that's how it's going to happen. She says that I sit as a queen. She said I'm no widow. That that language means that she is not helpless. See, the widows in that culture were helpless. I mean, if somebody didn't take care of them, they, they, didn't have, they didn't have anybody to do it. There was no welfare system. So the widows were helpless in that society. But she said, I am not a widow, but yet she's in control. She says, I am not. The system says, we don't need anybody to sustain us. Because we're sustaining ourselves. 
She, she had, the system will have the husbands and the husbands will be the kings. They, they will. You know, remember the ten kings that destroyed, the, destroyed the, the religious system? Those ten kings that gave all their power over to the Antichrist? So, <clears throat> but, but the system is going to sustain them and, as Charles has said, it will cause them to be deceived into believing that there is no threat to, to their power and control. They, they, they got this thing. You, you know, the Antichrist is running the government. He's ruling the world. Uh, he's ruling the economy. He's ruling all the business. Everything is booming. <clears throat> and he says, nothing can stop us now. It, you know, no, nothing is going to be able to bring us to this sorrow. See? Whew, I said his queen. Look at verse 8. <laughs> and the Lord says, therefore, therefore, therefore means what we've already read because she has said all that, because the system has been de deceiving the people. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day. Death and mourning and famine. And she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. What has taken thousands and thousands of years to establish? This rebellion against God which has been going on since the Garden of Eden will come to a head in those final seven years and in a short period of time, actually the last three and a half years, in a short period of time, will be put to an end. Thousands of years of rebellion and sin and all this against God. It took years to establish that. It's going to be brought down in a short amount of time. So, so, so the one day thing is not a literal one day. It's not like Tuesday, August the 20th <laughs> during the tribulation, Babylon will fall that day. It's going, to be a, it's going to be a falling, but it's going to be in a short time. It's not going to be gradual. It's going to happen in a short time. And once that happens, that's when Christ is going to, is going to come back to earth and set up his millennium. Here, here's how, how we know what that means. In Revelation chapter 16, this is your scripture references. Look in Revelation chapter 16 that we've already been through and look at verses 17 through 21. <clears throat> Verse 17 <clears throat> in chapter 16. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Who's on the throne? Who's at the right hand of the Father? Mm -hmm. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. There was a great earthquake. Such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. Capitals all over the world will fall. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of His wrath. That, that's just what we read. That's what He said. Mix into that cup double this wrath that's going to come upon her because of her sins. Now let's look at Isaiah. That's your other reference. Isaiah chapter 63. Good old Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63. Let's look at the first four verses of that chapter. <clears throat> and in this chapter, we, we read about the Lord's judgment and also His salvation. Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in His apparel, 
traveling in the greatness of His strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. That's the Lord. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the wine press? Y'all could answer that. Why are they red? How were we saved? By the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Verse 3, I have trodden the wine press alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me. Should be a capital M on that me there. For I have trodden them in my anger. I have trampled them in my fury. And their blood is sprinkled upon my garments. And I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart. And the year of my redeemed has come. Okay, can I put that simply? <clears throat> I'm going to kill the wicked and save the righteous. And who are the righteous? Those who have my blood <laughs> upon them. They're the righteous. They're the ones when He said, come out of her so that you're not caught up with her. So it's really pretty simple. The way the language is written and everything, it sounds poetic kind of in a sense. But really, it's just winding down. The, the, the business world has fallen. The religious world has fallen. It's just all coming to a halt. It's coming to a halt. And Christ is going to bring it to that point. It's getting there. I, I, know, we, I know we pray for our nation and I know we pray for the world. And, but listen, we got to pray for the lost. <laughs> we know what's going to happen with the nations. We're reading it. We know what this world is coming to. We know that there is no system in this world that's going to be able to save anybody. And even if it gets better, that's not a good sign because they were prosperous when God stepped in and wiped it out. So it's got to, it's got to, we got to turn the focus from, from all this stuff and turn the focus to souls and be ready for those. Be ready so that we know what's happening in the world. We know how, how this is going. I, I see Facebook posts and I read things sometimes and, and some people have the idea that, that they can really get God to change the way things are going to go. It's not going to happen, guys. I, I mean, we we got to pray for the people involved and not the circumstance. We, we can't pray about the situation, you know. we we got to pray about the people because they're the ones that have to come out of this system and have to come to Christ in order to be saved. Because the systems just just aren't going to do it. Now, next week we're going to look at verses 9 through 20. That's probably the biggest group of verses we've had in this whole study. But next week we're going to, we're going to look at that. And, and you'll understand it. It goes right along with, with exactly what we're talking about here. What we will see is, is what happens when it falls. But because they know it's going to fall and We'll see what, what all will take place during that. So questions or comments from anybody on that? Uh, or on any of it? It will, Charles. Yeah. It, it will. The whole world will. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, it will. And, and it's interesting when, when you see things. See, that's, that's one thing we, we have to try to understand. This, this tribulation is going to be seven years. Seven years is not a long period of time. I mean, presidents sit in office for four years. Think about it. They, they pull four-year terms. Seven years is not a long time. So they won't have enough time to establish everything that has to be established for the Antichrist to step into power. They, they won't have time to do that in seven years. So what will happen is, it will be established. The, the system will be in place. And when Christ comes and gets His church, the old Antichrist is going to step right out there. It's already going to be in place. All the systems, all the governments, all the commerce, all the stock markets, all the business, they're going to be situated in such a way that when we're gone then they will just step right in 
to power and start those seven years of tribulation. So, so that's why we see the things happening that we see happen. And, and we see how it's, how it's coming together. We, we can see that. We can see that. So listen, he may not come for another thousand years, and he might come before we get home tonight. He could. He could. There's nothing preventing that. That's why I made the comment about the Temple Mount. <clears throat> Do you guys know what started this battle in Israel? Let, let, me, give you, let me give it to you in a nutshell. <clears throat> I've been following this thing a long time. It didn't just happen Monday. <laughs> it culminated Monday. A month ago, a month ago, back in April, the, the, it was the month of Ramadan, which is the Muslim month of fasting and praying for, for the Muslims. Now listen, this thing going on over there, it is not a spiritual war between Muslims and, and Christians. It is not. If you try to look at it that way, it's not going to line up. Here's what the problem is. That Temple Mount in Jerusalem, where that mosque is located, that area is, is owned by Israel. Now, according to Palestine, but let, let me give you a quick history lesson. In 1948, prior to 1948, Israel and Palestine and that whole area was just one big group. Arabs and Jews, and, and they were all one big group. Well, in 1948, Israel became a sovereign state. Sovereign meaning they are recognized as a nation, having their own leader, having their own government, and they are a sovereign nation doing their own thing. Well, <clears throat> Palestine didn't come into that. Uh, Gaza and the West Bank and all those areas weren't included into that sovereign state. So, they want their own state. Gaza and, and Palestine and those areas, they want to be a sovereign nation too. But that hasn't happened. And the land that Israel has, Jerusalem sets within her borders of Israel. But the east side of that city, the east side is populated by Arabs. By Arabs, which from, from Jordan and Saudi Arabia. So you got the city of Jerusalem, west side of Jerusalem, and, and the other city is, is pretty much Jewish, ethnically, but, but there's Arabs and other, and other ethnicities. But the eastern side, there are Arabs who live there. I mean, that's just what they do. Well, Israel considers them squatters. <laughs> they, they shouldn't be there. But they've been there for years. Well, during this month of April, when Ramadan started, the Arabs coming out of the east part of Jerusalem who live there come to the mosque to worship. Well, they've always done that. There, there's nothing really new about that. But last month, the Israel decided there are six families who were living within that sector of the east side that they're going to evict. Six Arab families are going to be kicked out. Who that stirred up a fuss? Well, naturally, because they've been there for years, but now they say they're going to get kicked out. Well, that started the commotion. So, it, it went to the Israeli Supreme Court. They, they do business kind of like that. It went to the Supreme Court of Israel. And they were supposed to make a decision on Monday, two days ago. They were supposed to make a decision on whether or not these families could stay or if they were to go. Now listen, you got all the Arab community who was saying they're going to stay because they've been here. And you got Israel that says, no, they're going to go because this is our territory. So the Supreme Court was supposed to make a decision on that. I don't tell you what, what's going to happen when the Supreme Court makes a decision. Somebody going to be mad, ain't they? Well, on Sunday, on Sunday, the Supreme Court of Israel said, we're not going to make that decision right now. Oh, Lord. Now, now you got two sides that are mad. At least if they would have made a decision 
you would have had one mad side and one happy side. Now they got two mad sides. So when they went to prayer at the end of Ramadan on Friday, when they went into prayer to the mosque and the Israeli police and everybody's out there, they're all keyed up and they come out and they started throwing rocks at the Israeli police. That's how the skirmish started. And it went from rocks to grenade to the to the deafening grenades, the sound grenades. You know, we used to call them smoke bombs or, you know, them cherry bombs. Boom, they're deafening. They don't kill people, but they make a lot of noise. They started that. And when they started that, well, you know, Israel's not just going to sit back and let that happen. So they got riled up and they come against the Arabs. Well, in, in Gaza, it, it, how many remembers the PLO? Palestinian... Well, they are Hamas now. They, they pretty much migrate into what they call Hamas. You hear that name in the news? Hamas is the military component of Palestine. They're, they're like the army. They're the military. So they get involved when you start attacking their people. Well, yeah, that's what militaries do. So now you got Hamas, the military segment, attacking Israel over this families, these Arab families, who are supposed to be evicted and are not going to be. So what do they start doing? They start shooting rockets at each other. That's what's happening in Israel. It is a political, national thing right now about who owns that little parcel of land that those Arabs are on. Now we know where that goes back to biblically. You know where the Arabs come from, right? Know where the Arabs come from? Ishmael. Ishmael. Remember him? Remember who Ishmael is? Abraham's son by Hagar. Yep. Abraham's son. Abraham's son. Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. You can trace them down. Well, Abraham's her father. Can't say he's not, right? But he was not the son of promise. But the son of promise is who? Isaac. And his people are Hebrews. So see, it's just a natural... It's, it's just there. It's always been there. So this escalation is really, it's really nothing new in regards to the relationship, but it is a political thing that's going on between Israel and Hamas. And, and that's where it is. Now, how, how is that going to affect the revelation? How is that going to affect how everything comes out? Well, the temple that they will worship at during the tribulation is going to be at the Temple Mount. It's going to be in Jerusalem. It's been prophesied. That's where it's going to be. It's going to be there. So, sooner or later, the Jews are going to have to get control of that thing. Right? Sooner or later, it's going to have to be all theirs. Right now, it's not all theirs. Right now, it's shared. But in that day, in this day, it's going to belong to them and them alone. So when, when these things come about and these things escalate, <laughs> that's a good sign. That's where we're headed, guys. That's where we're headed. Isn't that interesting? And, and, and we pray, you know, we, we talk about praying for the peace over there. We, we do, and we do that. But listen, peace is not going to come until the Prince of Peace steps into that area on the Mount of Olives. And He's going to do that at the end of the tribulation. And until that happens, <laughs> you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars until all that takes place. So, aren't you glad we live here? Man, I thank God all the time. I don't worry about a rocket coming through my roof. I don't worry about that. I don't have to worry about it. Don't even give it a second thought. Can you imagine the innocent people, the babies and the children and, and the elderly people? And can, can you imagine all the innocent people that are affected 
by this war, by, by this escalation, this thing. It, it's pitiful. It's pitiful. That's why I put on Facebook what Isaiah said. God protects Israel and He will save her. We've just read that. Come what may, He's going to rescue her. <laughs> He's going to do it. Questions or comments on any of it? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I laid the boundaries out. Yes, sir. Did you hear what his question was? He said, is Israel trying to defend the land that they own or are they trying to take land that belongs to the Arabs, to the Palestinians? Buddy, if you can answer that, you will have the million dollar question answered because that's where the fight is. That's Yeah, it's it's their right. It's theirs. It, it's no doubt. That's why in 48, the area where they are became a sovereign nation. But yet, there was a part of that which wasn't included in that. And that's where the fight comes in. Uh, I saw a thing years ago. I read, I read and can't remember where I read it. Some magazine. I was reading in a doctor's office. But, but I was reading this political thing even then. And this has been years ago. <laughs> and this was when Bin Laden was still alive. And Bin Laden, see, was in that group that's fighting where they're fighting now. And when he was behind all that stuff and pushing it, they got allies. But anyway, this this guy said, well, you know what started all this ruckus to start with, don't you? Is who owns the land? <clears throat> and this one fellow says, well, you know, Bin Laden says, well, we own it. I mean, we own it. There's no doubt about that. And he said, no. Do you know how it happened? He said, one of your people was down at the River Jordan taking a swim and, and one of the Israelites came and stole these clothes and ran with them. And that's what started all that. And Bin Laden said, that's a lie. That is a lie. Because there were no Palestinians in that day. And the guy says, I rest my case. Huh? They're all Jews. See? So where did this group come out of? If you look at if you look at the Palestinians and you say, well, where did they at, how did they get the name Palestinians? Where did that come from? It came from Philistines. Remember the Philistines? That they have trickled down, and that's that's where the that's where the word Palestine is actually rooted through. It comes down through the terminology which brought it down through Philista. Which brings it, if you trace it back, they trace it etymology, it's called of the word. It goes back to, to Philista, which is where the Philistines <laughs> come out of. So, it, listen, it, it's all right here, guys. <laughs> it's all right there. So, anybody else? Father, we thank you tonight. Oh, we thank you for your Holy Spirit whose hand is upon us and who watches over us and who keeps us. The one who watches over Israel, you said in your word, never slumbers nor sleeps. And we know that. So Father, help us as we study these things, more importantly, to focus on those who are lost. There is a lost world out here and the devil is doing everything he can do to distract them from this salvation that you're offering. But one day, one day, Lord, all this is going to happen that we're reading about. So I pray for those who don't know You in our families, in our community, even in our churches. Those who have, have never been born again. Lord, I pray that all this stuff just, just draws their attention to You so that they don't have to get, get caught up in the politics or they don't have to get caught up in the economy. They don't have to get caught up in all this stuff that they just reach out to You and say, I trust You and whatever comes, comes because I know that I can trust You to save me. That's what, we, that's what we want them to see. And we'll give You all the praise and the glory for it. In Your wonderful name, Jesus, 
I pray by faith. And all His people say, we love You, Lord. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for watching. Pray for the service on Sunday.